Time for another edition of the Fast Podcast, and I'm kind of all over the place on things. I guess when you're when you're interested in a million different things, you go in different directions every time you you have a have a discussion like this. And I'm very fortunate to have a few minutes today. Maybe we'll stretch it more than a few minutes, but to uh, to visit with a with a guy I've known for an awfully long time, and and I say that with um, with admiration and warmth in my heart. We have uh, former. Carolina Panthers quarterback, and we'll go backwards, Saints quarterback, uh, NFL Europe player. We, of course, before that, the Raging Cajuns and even earlier, Jake, a uh, Turlings Rebel. We got Jake DeLone visiting for a few minutes with us. Jake, thanks for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. And, uh, yep, that's pretty much a walk down uh, memory lane. Backwards. We did it a little backwards there. But, uh, but you know, it's it, the road that people travel to, to – to, to leave their legacy, and I mean, you we're talking your football legacy now, To the path that you took is, to say unconventional, is probably not doing justice to the road that you traveled. And, and I wanted to take a, a little time today to, to kind of go backwards and go to go to your days at Turlings and how you ended up on this uh, on this path that, that is getting you inducted into the Carolina Panthers Hall of Honor this season, which, by the way, congrats on that. Well, thank you very much. Very, uh, you know, it's hard to put into words how I feel about this honor. Uh, I've been lucky enough to play a kid's game, and along the way has come some very good football teams, which enabled me to get some individual accolades. But this uh, this ranks up at the, at the ap- a- absolute top for me. Well, you know, I, 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 you and I have talked about this before. When you were at Turlings, um, obviously a very good student. You had, you know, great academics and, and opportunities with academics, but – but to play football and specifically to play quarterback, they weren't exactly beating your door down, were they? No, you know, it, they really weren't. I uh, I was lucky enough. Uh, Turlings at the time was a single-A football team, and we were um, we were a powerhouse with 25 guys on the team, including <laughs> freshmen. So, uh, needless to say, we uh, we only needed one bus to get to the uh, get to the stadium on game day, but. Uh, things worked out. You know, I, uh, I was offered by everybody in state besides LSU. Um, you know, got offered by Duke. Uh, West Point was looking at me, the Naval Academy, things like that. And I decided to stay home and play for uh, Coach Stokely and Coach Lewis Cook, who was recruiting me, and it's the best decision I ever made. You know, so when you were being recruited, a lot of people, because you had been an all-state defensive back, a lot of people were looking at you for defense and not necessarily for offense. Isn't that true? Well, I think it was going to be mostly offense. I did play defense because, like I said, we, uh, you know, we didn't have the largest of rosters, so we, we kind of all went both ways. But uh, I mean, there was some talk of me possibly playing defense, but it was going to be quarterback, that's for sure. So you end up at, at USL at the time, uh, and as a freshman, the plan was that you wouldn't see the field except for the practice field, and that changed quickly. On opening day, your freshman season, go back to that game and and what what that meant to your future in the the world of football. Yeah, I uh, really thought I was going to probably redshirt. Uh, probably needed time to uh, for physical maturity because I was a you know 175 pound freshman quarterback, six foot two, and might have I might have sh- uh, picked up a razor twice a month to shave. <laughs> so I, uh, I hadn't hit full maturity yet, to say the least, and. Uh, uh, as camp went on, they would kind of throw me in there with the twos, and I kind of had an idea that, you know, there's a chance you could play if, if things don't go well. They were trying to redshirt me, and I wasn't quite sure how things were going to go with the other quarterbacks. And, um, well, we struggled a little bit early on in that game, and so they played a few guys, and at halftime I got the look from Coach Cook with those eyes said, all right, you up, and basically saying, you're up and nobody else is going in. You got it? And uh, and it kind of went from there. And it was uh, it was a great campaign that season. Talk about about that freshman season and and the big Big West Conference. Well, you know, certainly uh, UL uh, or USL at the time was an ind- was independent, and uh, it was the first year to get some type of conference affiliation. And so here we are in Louisiana playing in the Big West Conference. Uh, so. Uh, but we loved it. We enjoyed it. We loved it, and we were able to win the conference that year. And it was a tie between us and uh, uh, I believe it was Utah State. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we went eight and three that year. Uh, we had votes at one point in the top twenty-five, and we had um, a team that was just waiting to explode. Uh, I, I, that's how I would describe us. Uh, 
they were coming off two uh, two win seasons back to back. There was a lot of young talent, and I think they were just kind of missing a quarterback. And I was able to come in and help fill that void. And uh, we were led by a good defense and led by the late uh, and great Orlando Thomas, who was uh, went on to the NFL, was NFL Rookie of the Year. Um, and unfortunately lost his life to, to Lou Gehrig's disease. But uh, we had some talented guys that loved to compete, and uh, we loved to get after it, and uh, it made for a lot of fun, and Cajun Field uh, was, was fun for a few years. You know, there, there, I have so many memories as a fan of, of, of your years here, and there's, there's the one, cr- I guess, crowning achievement for the, for the program, and it's, it's the A&M game. There were so many other great games and other big wins along the way, but, but that game was – I guess the pinnacle when it comes to beating a, a, a you know a college football power, though they were a little bit down that year. You guys, with the help of that defense leading the way, uh, really did have a miracle at Cajun Field that night, and and I know that's got to be one of your fondest memories. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it's kind of unheard of, especially in this day day and age, for a big uh, Power Five school to travel to a to really a mid major, and at that point. Uh, I think the contract worked out. I think U, uh, USL had to travel five times uh, to uh, college station, uh, college station, and in return, A and M would return the favor. And so I think they looked at it uh, as a, as kind of like, hey, we'll go play. It's a what four, four and a half hour drive. It's not that far. We have a big uh, fan base in Louisiana. Some of these recruits in Louisiana, uh, we can play kind of close to here and. Um, we, we had a pretty salty little football team, and we opened up with Florida that year, who that year, 1993, was, they were the national champions. So mm-hmm. we, uh, we opened up with them, and we knew we had a pretty good football team. We kind of hung with them for a good bit, and A&M was coming uh, into uh, our, our Cajun field. It was going to be a packed house, and we were going to shock the world. And that was the mentality that we all uh, we took, and that's how we practiced, that's how we prepared, and that's how we played that night. Um, and they had a little some issues on offense. Our defense had something to do with that. And uh, offensively, we did just enough because I truly believe all 11 starters on that uh, wrecking crew defense played in the NFL at some point. So we had our hands full, but uh, we were able to make enough plays. And uh, it worked out, and it made for a great, great night. I don't know if you've ever gone back. I know you see the, the film, you know, the game film that you guys have, but have you ever gone back and watched – the broadcast because that game was done on I guess it was Fox Sports Southwest or or whatever the channel was at that time and and a guy I've known since right after he was done in college and that's Bucky Richardson was the the color guy have you ever heard that broadcast uh I don't think I ever did uh unless I watched it right after uh we played uh but you're starting to stretch my memory a little bit. I'm not quite sure. I wasn't a big guy. I never went back and watched television copies of games that I played. That's just something that I kind of always – I just never did. Uh, one, because I just kind of knew how my mind works sometimes. If I would hear an announcer say something that was totally wrong, I, I would kind of file that back in my mental Rolodex. So I never put myself in that situation, and I wouldn't go back. I just kind of watched more of the coaches' tape. I have it somewhere, and and I laugh because, again, I I knew Bucky a little bit. We had a a, a mutual friend from Baton Rouge, and so I kind of got to know him a little. And and you can just hear it in his voice, the absolute disbelief. I mean, here's a Baton Rouge guy who, you know, drove right past Lafayette to go to College Station, and we were not even a blip on his radar when it came to the world of college football. He grew up in LSU land and played in Aggie land, and here he comes to Lafayette, close to home, probably planning on coming here, a quick win and dinner with his family, and then going back to Texas. And you, you need to hear it because the, the the shock and awe in his voice at the end of the game when you're running around swinging your helmet is priceless. You know what? That would probably probably be pretty funny to listen to. And uh, I, um, Bucky Richardson, you know, an A&M legend. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I can only imagine how exactly how he felt at that time. Yeah, well, I mean, again, a Louisiana guy, so he's looking at it like this can't be happening. You know, this just can't be real. But it was more than real. I mean, with the goalposts coming down and the whole deal, it was a, it was a great college football moment. And 
then you fin you know you finish out your career here statistically good years all four years and I know that that you had some some great teammates around you and you had a good offensive line you had good running backs of course you and Brandon had some some chemistry that that a lot of quarterbacks and wide receivers wish they had but as you finished up your college career what did you think was the likelihood that you were really going to get a chance to play pro football uh great question I I really and truly you know, I wasn't invited to the combine, and I, I, one of my—I'm not a big goal setter. That was never—that was never something. Uh, I don't know. I just—that was never me. I just always wanted to kind of live in the moment, do anything and everything I can for 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 that moment, and uh, m- and prepare myself for whatever opportunity arises. But I always, one thing I always wanted to do—I wanted to play in the blue gray game, and that was played on Christmas morning. And at the time, there were barely any bowls, uh, not anything like there is right now. Right. Um, so, you know, the, the bowl games probably for us would not have – the tie-in for uh, the Big West Conference, I believe, was played before Christmas. So, regardless if we could have made it or not, uh, the blue-gray game was something I always wanted uh, – it was a goal of mine. Never got, never got a call, an invitation or anything, and it wasn't like they were loaded with uh, uh, much quarterback talent in that game. So you, you hold out hope, possibly get invited to the combine. Now, combine came and went, and I'd get invited to the combine. I had two teams that I worked out for. One was the Miami Dolphins, and the other one was for the uh, New Orleans Saints. And the New Orleans Saints workout was actually in Metairie at the uh, facility. Mm-hmm. Had a really good workout there that day. I think I opened some eyes that day, and I would have been more or less a, uh, a camp arm, so to speak. And uh, that's kind of the way it went. Uh, the, the draft came and went, and uh, the free agent signings kind of came and went. And then a few days after that, the Saints contacted me to kind of come in on a tryout basis, and uh, it just kind of worked out. And and so you go in, and that was uh, – Ditka was still here then, correct? Yeah, it was actually Mike Ditka's first year. Correct. Okay, so Ditka was here. So you kind of went the whole gamut through Ditka's era and then the early years of Jim Hazlitt, and, and – you're on the roster, off the roster, practice squad, and I don't know if they called it taxi squad. Then I can't remember. I get all the terminology mixed up. But you were on the on the on the 53 man roster one week, and then maybe you weren't the next week, and then they would cut you, and then they would bring you back in. And we were all like on pins and needles here because we're like, if they just give that guy a chance, we've seen what he can do. And you would get little opportunities. You got preseason opportunities, and again, back then that was when most teams kept three quarterbacks on the roster every week. It's very different now, but you were usually the third guy on the roster, but you got a couple of moments to show what you could do. Talk about those few days in a Saints uniform where you were playing for literally the home team and what that was like before you ended up leaving to go to Carolina. Well, uh, you know, opportunities are very, uh, very hard to come by the quarterback position because, you know, obviously only one guy gets to play. It's not like linemen or tight ends or running backs or receivers where multiple guys can be on the field at a time. So, um, yeah, very limited opportunity with Mike Ditka, very, uh, some limited opportunity in the preseason with Coach Ditka and his staff. And, and I think that was just the way everything was run. There really wasn't a rhyme, and re- uh, rhyme or reason to how things were kind of done back then. And I would get sent to NFL Europe in the spring, so mm-hmm. I had no off season with the team or, or trying to learn a playbook and things like that. And it wasn't until, you know, Coach Dick just started me his second to last game. Uh, we played Dallas mm-hmm. on Christmas Eve. And I was probably, um, in, in their mind, uh, hey, we're not playing any good. Might as well play the young kid. And so went in. We had a big day that day. We were able to beat Dallas. And, that was pretty fun, uh, to say the least. Uh, only only game on ta- on TV that day, and we were able to beat him. And so I started the last two games that year, and then he gets fired. So kind of starting back up all over again with Jim Haslett and his regime. And that was my first taste of true NFL football, to be quite honest. Uh, Mike McCarthy, the longtime Green Bay Packer coach, was mm-hmm. our offensive coordinator. And I got exposed to NFL football the proper way and uh, learned the proper way to prepare Uh, get myself ready to play and all the nuances of an NFL playbook. And that helped open up, you know, my my eyes, I should say, to the NFL and, you know, just kind of kept going along from there. So the end of the on-again, off-again roster kind of ended with that bunch and just kind of went smooth from – 
I wouldn't. I'm not saying smooth, but smoother from that point on. Well, so they they bring Jeff Blake in, and 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 it's really a sad story to me because I think that guy could have been a starter and a really productive quarterback for the Saints for years for years if he hadn't had that horrific injury injury against Oakland. Yeah, and that was like week ten or week eleven, um, somewhere along those lines, and. Jeff was playing the best football of his career, mm-hmm. and we were uh, we were kind of like leading the division. We were doing well. Jeff was playing really, really good football. Um, and then that happened, and then uh, Aaron Brooks is who the team traded for in training camp. Uh, Aaron started playing, and, you know, Aaron's natural athletic ability kind of took over, and we had a pretty good, you know, we had, we had a pretty good nucleus on that team, and uh, we were able to win the division and win the first playoff game in Saints history up until that point. So, uh, it just kind of went from there. And then the, the next two years, it was almost like cruise control uh, because the next year was I was Jeff Blake and Aaron Brooks, and I was the third guy. So I just kind of became a, uh, maybe not another coach, so to speak, but Mike McCarthy would always have these projects for me to do. Uh, I had to do our quarterback tip sheet every week, and he wanted to make sure my mind kept, uh, you know, just kind of kept it sharp. Because Aaron was the starter, Jeff was the backup, and I was the third guy, so the likelihood of me playing uh, was pretty slim. So just kind of keep grinding away and keep working. So the last year you were in New Orleans, I I remember this like it was yesterday. There's a a game at the end of the year against the Panthers, and I I think we we lost maybe 10 to 6 or 13 to 10 or something like that. But the crowd wanted you – to play it was one of those games Aaron wasn't playing very well Carolina wasn't playing very well and I think if we won that game we had an opportunity to go to the playoffs and and the crowd chanted your name over and over and over again and I remember again being being a fan first a Saints fan all my life but a Jake fan more than a Saints fan at that point thinking please just put the guy in I mean what's what's the worst thing that can happen and they didn't put you in and I remember seeing you at Evangel and Downs after you had signed your contract in the offseason and telling you man you're killing me you're going to play not only for somebody else but you're going to play within the division but I totally got it because that was to me you have another team that is interested in giving you a chance you saw where you had a chance in New Orleans and they didn't give you the opportunity to show what you could do that day. Well, you're, you're exactly right. We were playing Carolina last game of the year. We needed All we needed to do was beat them and get into the playoffs. But better yet, all we needed to do was win one out of our last three games to get into the playoffs. Right. And we didn't do it. And I had to play earlier in December on a Sunday night to close out the game against Tampa, who were the Super Bowl champs uh, that year. Uh, then I played the following week against Baltimore. So Aaron had a shoulder injury. Um we really, and no one really knew the extent of it, but he had a shoulder injury. Uh, people could tell there was an issue. And, you know, we were struggling, to say the least, against Carolina. We did lose 10-6, and they had nothing to play for, and we had everything to play for. So, you know, the crowd was chanting, and uh, it was uh, that was a, a, a kind of an awkward feeling because you have players looking at you, and I think the players were kind of – some of them were saying the same thing. Hey, put him in. Let's try to win this game. Uh, but – it didn't happen, and, um, you know, it, it, it just worked out. That's all I can say. It just worked out. It just so happened Carolina um, was one of, it was the team I signed with and just so happened to be in the division. And yeah, so, and I forgave you. I mean, I actually had a not love Jake sign in my, in my front yard <laughs> like every like everybody else. But, we uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny looking back on that. It seems like it was just yesterday. I mean, it really does seem like that was – it was like, what, 15 years ago, I guess, or give or take a little bit that that happened. But so you leave, you go to Carolina, and you're, you're in a somewhat, I guess, similar situation. Rodney, Rodney Pete's the starter, and that's already determined. And you're going to be Rodney's backup. And almost an exact duplicate of what happened your first game as a freshman at USL happened opening week in Carolina. Relive that for me. Yeah, exactly right. Sign with Carolina. Um the only difference, I guess, I did sign, you know, like a, a backup type of deal, but Rodney was of age. Rodney was in his 13th or 14th year, yep. 36 years old, and he had actually signed the year prior to back up Chris Winkie. That's right. Chris had played a ton as a rookie. But then Chris had an injury and just didn't come back that well from it, and so Rodney had to play. 
Um, and it was a team kind of on the cusp. And so I came in, and Rodney was fantastic. You know, uh, we all kind of split reps, and, and, you know, he was a starter. But uh, when I went in at halftime of the first game, we were struggling a little bit to put uh, to get anything hap- make anything happen on offense. And I got thrown in, and we were able to come back and win the game toward the end. And Rodney was my biggest supporter, biggest cheerleader. Um, and, you know, a great teammate for the next couple of years. So it just it just all worked out. So you end up your freshman year, USL first year in the Big West. You come in at halftime of the first game of the season, end up winning the starting job and, and winning a con- or sharing a conference title with Utah State. First game in Carolina, you come in at halftime, and I, I know Rodney had really struggled in the in the first half that day. And, and there's an urban legend, and I'll finish the story, but there's an urban legend I want to interject here. And, and I don't know if it's actually true, but it's one of the funniest stories I've heard, that you come into the huddle after halftime, you're like, all right, guys, we're going to make a comeback. We can do this. And, and one of the old, line looks at, the old linemen looks at you and says, who are you? <laughs> well, it Have you heard that story? It wasn't who are you. I came in, and I was uh... – I, I, I was juiced up now. I was ready to go. And of course. I was slapping, slapping hands, slapping behinds, and I said something. And uh, it was a tight end, Chris Mangum, who's my best friend. He lives in Mississippi, and he has a Mississippi twang. And he was like, hey, 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 settle down. We can't understand a word you're saying with that Louisiana <laughs> accent. And That's so, even and better. It just kind of made for a little bit of uh, brief laughter in the huddle at that, at that point. Well, and that's a great story. I, I I knew it had been kind of changed over the years, but it's great to hear it from your mouth and and uh, what what it was like. And you came in and you did settle down, and you guys ended up coming back. I think you were down maybe twenty eight nothing or twenty eight seven. You end up winning that game, and then again, here you go. You mark you start the next fifteen weeks of the regular season, and similar to what happened here, but a little bit better. You end up not only in the playoffs, but as your for a first year. Back up, winning the starting job in week one, you guys end up, I don't want to blame John Casey, but you end up a kickoff away from having a really good chance to win that Super Bowl against New England. Yeah, you know, we were double-digit underdogs going into that game. Uh, New England, uh, really and truly, they, they, they weren't the dynasty that they, they have been. Um, you know, they had won the Super Bowl two years prior. Um, but that year, defensively, they were absolutely loaded. Um, the Hall of Famers on that defense um, that they had, and, and they hadn't allowed, like, nobody scored over, like, 19 points on them. They didn't allow, allow a run over 20-something yards. They didn't allow passes over this. You know, maybe only two touchdown passes was the most somebody ever threw against them in a game. And uh, we were double-digit underdogs. And, uh, you know, we came, we showed up, we played our tail off, and, uh, you know, this guy by the name of Tom Brady uh, engineered a, a, a late two-minute drive, and this guy that's still playing by the name of Adam Vinatieri nailed the uh, a field goal with four seconds left. So, uh, you know, you tip your hat to those guys, but uh, we, we made a good run for it. You made a great run. It was an exciting Super Bowl. It was, you know, one of the better Super Bowl games. It was a really competitive, close football game. Not, It was a lot less pomp and circumstance and – and pregame nonsense and halftime nonsense, then it was really still the two best football teams from that season playing a real football game to try to win. I think it's kind of, I don't want to say become watered down, but it's become so much showbiz now, and I and I really kind of yearn for, for a game like that again. Well, it, it got pretty wild, but, you know, listen, the first quarter and the third quarter was pretty darn boring because both defenses were kind of, you know, they were in charge, and uh, New England's defense, they were – we couldn't do much against them in the first quarter. And it wasn't until, like, right before half we were able to kind of open up a few things on them. And then you have this long break at halftime, which is unlike any other NFL game because it's such a short halftime. But this one's long. They can recover. Uh, and it went back to being a kind of a, a battle until we finally kind of went no huddle and, and tied them out a little bit. Well, you know, you, you had a, gr- a great run in Carolina. You, you stayed in the league for for a few more years. Played, you know, in Cleveland and ended up in Houston. And 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 I, but I know that that your 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 you know fondest memories in the NFL. Though you may have some individual friends and and moments that happened in other places, but but Carolina really did become your home. And for a kid from Brobridge 
to not only move away from home where home is everything down here, as, as you and I both know, to, to, to be adopted as like a son of the city of Charlotte and the state of North Carolina has to be something really special that you'll take with you for the rest of your days. Oh, there, there, there's no doubt. It's, uh, it's beyond special. Um, listen, when we packed up our, our Suburban and a, and a U-Haul, my wife and I, with, in tow, was, was a three-month-old, and moved to Charlotte, moved in an apartment, and, you know, kind of made a life for ourselves over, the, over there. And uh, Charlotte did become home for us, or our second home, I should say. And, um, you know, that's, that's how we feel about it, how we, uh, we, we just, we loved it. But, you know, the attraction to come home was always going to be there for us with our families, uh, all, everyone being from here. And, you know, listen, we don't regret it one, one iota uh, a decision that we made to, that we came back and moved back home. And uh, our girls are enjoying a great life here, uh, enjoying school and friends. But Carolina holds a special place. We don't get to go back nearly as often as we'd like. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's a place we can always – it's okay to have a second home. I think that's how we look at it. And in Carolina, I truly uh, – I truly feel is my second home well and and you'll be going there at least one week this season what was it like to get the call that you were going to be a part of the uh the hall of honor for the carolina panthers you know what uh a call that uh totally unexpected had no idea they were even doing this uh because in essence only one person has ever been in the uh the hall of honor or the ring of honor uh in the stadium is that sam mills sam mills right and he was such a re- such a revered uh, individual and human being that, um, you know, no one ever – it wasn't talked about because the first year in Carolina, that was the ninth season uh, of the uh, Panthers organization. Um, so it was still in its infancy. So now going into the 25th season, um, the, the new owner has come in, and and I, and I believe rightfully so. He wants to kind of expand this Hall of Honor, and uh, it will slowly expand over the next few years. And uh, – but I think they're going to keep the criteria uh, pretty stringent. And uh, but it's nice to go in. I'm honored. I'm I'm grateful. I'm humbled by it. I, um, and to be able to be able to go in with the other three guys, Wesley Walls was never a teammate, but another close friend of mine. We lived in the same neighborhood in Charlotte. Uh, we got to know each other very well. And unfortunately, I saw him catch many touchdowns against the Saints. Uh, when I was a member of the Saints, and he was with the Panthers. Right. And then Steve Smith and Jordan Gross. It's uh, those two guys with Steve and Jordan. It's hard for me to put into words what those two guys meant to me on and off the field. Uh, both great players, great people. Um, it's just it, it's an absolute honor to go in with those two guys. Well, you know, I guess being being a, a lifelong Saints fan, you're when when it's a team that's within the division, you you become a little bit more familiar with them because as a fan, you see them twice where you see anybody else you play maybe once or maybe once every couple of years. So, Steve Smith, I, I think I've had more than one nightmare about that guy, but, but you had to respect him. He's he's a, Talk about an overachiever. That guy was an overachiever. Yeah, he was, uh, you know, Steve is, listen, he is five foot nine, and he's 190, 195 pounds when he played, um, but you, you swore he was the biggest guy on the field. Um, just a guy with a chip on his shoulder, um, that was – it's you couldn't put into words how big that chip was. And he practiced that way. He played that way. Um, and everybody else kind of raised up their game around him. And, um, you know, he was special. And he'll definitely be a first ballot Hall of Famer, um, and rightfully so. But uh, he's given many a Saints fan uh, <laughs> nightmares, and he's given uh, many fans uh, across the NFL nightmares uh, because he was good for a long time. No, he always had such an extra bad attitude against us, too. It was uh, it was fun, though. I mean, look, that's what this is all about. It's rivalries make, make football worthwhile. I mean, and I think that's at every level. I mean, I know it was that way when you were at Turling's. There are certain schools that you get a little bit more geeked up for than the others. Yeah, and, you know, especially in the NFL, uh, each week it's such a battle. But there's something about division games because you, you do play those teams twice a year, and uh, you always try to win your division and that's um, you, you, because that means you got your foot in the door for the playoffs. So um, every game means something, but, the, but division games, uh, it, was, it always had that extra spice to it. Before I let you go, and again, we're, we're visiting with Jake DeLome, who will be inducted in the all of the uh, Hall of Honor, I think is the official title, but you can call it Ring of Honor, Hall of Fame for the Panthers uh, during the football season. I, the, the date has not been determined for that yet, has it? 
Uh, there, there's some talk. It's going to be possibly the Jacksonville game, which is October 6th. Okay. Um, there's another chance, maybe November 3rd game, but I think it's kind of leaning toward the uh, Jacksonville uh, game on October the 6th. Well, I, two things real quick before we let you go. And, and again, I'll, we, we'll, we'll all be watching that. I mean, again, Saints fans or Cowboys fans or whatever, if you're, if you're from, from home and that's Acadiana, you, our, our sons and daughters come first. So uh, your achievements are, are, are shared by all of us in the sense that we're, we're rooting for you every step of the way, even though sometimes I, I wouldn't have minded you getting an L on a Sunday. But, but, um, but it, was, it was only certain weeks that I rooted for that. But, you know, Jake, when I knew you had made it, I've never told you this. I walked in the grocery store, and there was this life-size Doritos cut out of you and Carrie. And I was like, okay, he's a star. Jake, Jake DeLome is selling Doritos at Winn-Dixie. This, this is a big deal. Do you remember that photo shoot? Do you remember doing that? Uh, I vividly remember doing it. Tostito. Maybe it was Tostito. I remember the hundreds of texts that I would get from any and everybody that I knew in the grocery store. <laughs> and if I could tell you how many times they sent a picture of them slapping my face or like make as if they have the cardboard in a, in a headlock. Um, but yes, well, I do remember that. And, uh, yeah, sometimes when you play quarterback, sometimes you get put in those positions to do those things. And, uh, yeah, but it's all in good fun. Oh, it was awesome to walk in the store. I'm like, holy cow, he made it. It's like a national ad campaign. It's not uh, the Suncom wireless radio commercial here or even a Bojangles commercial back in uh, in Carolina. This was a national Super Bowl advertising campaign, and it was it was really cool to see that. So, so before we let you go, one question, and I know there are a lot of people in your life relatives family friend you know family members and friends that, that have had an impact on you but when it comes to the game of football at any level is there one person more than any other that that has had an incredible amount of and and, a, and maybe their unfair share of influence and input in making you or helping to develop you into the player that you became well i mean and, I, and we're talking coaches here um uh, it's hard for me to pinpoint one. It's two, and they kind of they ran back to back. It was Sonny Chaponche at Turlings and Louis Cook um, at, at UL, and to have those two guys, not only they're great football minds, but they're better people, and they're unbelievably strong Catholic men uh, who believe who believe in family. But uh, Sonny, just the technical aspect of throwing the football and all these little tidbits that I was able to get from him. From the time he started coaching me um, in, in, gosh, I want to say in the eighth grade um, up until I went to Coach Cook. And then, then it just everything that I was taught by Sonny was validated by Coach Cook at UL. Um, and so those two, it's kind of hard to uh, pinpoint anybody else because you're so impressionable at that age and things like that. I've had great NFL coaches, absolutely fantastic mentors, other players and things like that. But at that point in my life, growing up, learning how to play and things like that, learning how to, um, you know, I think being a leader is innate. I think it's just kind of something you're born with, um, and you can learn some tidbits along the way. And those two men really helped mold me in, in, in that regard. You know, they, they're, they are both fine men. They, they, are, they are fine people first and great football and athletic people because, of course, Sonny was a basketball guy too. A lot of people don't even really realize – his background and you know coaching basketball but you know as as someone who had a son that played for Louis Cook it you know when you when you entrust your child to 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 a, a father figure away from home it takes a special person to to make make a dad say I wish I could be more like his coach and coach Cook is that guy well th there's there's no doubt and uh, he is that guy and, and and that's why he's all the success that he's had and He'd never admit to it that he had a part in any of this. He was just an old ball coach, but that's what makes the great ones. Well, Jake, we are super proud of you and, and happy. And, and look, it, it's it's a tough road to instant stardom, right? I mean, people think, hey, here he comes. He shows up in Carolina. He, overnight, he just becomes a starting quarterback. And if they only knew, and I'm hoping that maybe a couple of your, your fans and, and friends back home in Carolina, home away from home in Carolina, will listen to this podcast and maybe get – a little bit of insight into to what happened before that that fateful September day when you came in at halftime and everything changed for everybody. 
Well, you know, it's uh, it was a long road, but I wouldn't I wouldn't you know trade one minute of it. It's uh, it was fun. You know, it, it, maybe it was tough along the way, but I I enjoyed doing it. And sure, I think I lost you, Jake. Got me? Oh, now I got you back. Yeah, I lost you there for a second. That was an emergency whatever on the phone and on my watch, and it just overrode everything. Well, we don't want you to okay. drown. So. <laughs> no, I, I'm, in, I'm in my truck. It's a flash flood warning in this area until 645, so I didn't know what was going on. That's well, crazy. technology is a, it's a little beyond me. I'm getting too too far up there to, 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 catch, to catch a hold of everything, but look. Yeah, yeah, I value your friendship and and what you offer to our community, but both with your connection to UL and and the other other things that you're involved with, charity wise and in business and and, and you, we are uh, we are blessed to have you here, and I certainly appreciate you taking a half an hour of your time, which I know is valuable to spend with me. Now, now go spend some time with your beautiful family, and and thanks, and hopefully we'll catch up during football season and maybe maybe visit a little bit about what it's like after you come back to South Louisiana as a, a member of the Hall of honor up in charlotte sounds good man i appreciate it fast you have a great day all right thanks jake you too jake delome former turlings rebel former raging cajun former new orleans saint and most importantly at least in this discussion former carolina panther and again it's hard when when somebody that you like plays for a team that you don't Always had respect for Carolina. Was always a Wesley Walls fan. Of course, as a Saints fan, we loved Sam Mills when he left. And uh, Panther fans, if you're listening to this, I will tell you, I can't admit it. Well, I'm admitting it in front of the whole world right now on the internet. But but that season that Jake got the team all the way to the Super Bowl, I, there were more than a handful of Saints fans down here that had Jake DeLome and Carolina gear and had Carolina signs in their yard. So... We may not like you very much during the regular season, but uh, but I don't know. For at least one year, you guys were our other favorite team. This has been the Fast Podcast. We try to update it about once a week. The uh, discussions vary, but very blessed to have Hall of uh, Honor, Carolina Panther, and uh, and homeboy from Brobridge and Turlings Catholic, Jake DeLome, with us today. We'll see you down the road here on the Fast Podcast. Thanks for tuning in.